Okay. I think uh, all yours, Lauren, go ahead. All right, thanks, Bill. As Bill mentioned, my name is Lauren. I'm also a natural resources educator with UW-Madison Extension. And tonight we're gonna be talking about how to attract wildlife to your woodland. So tonight we'll cover some wildlife management basics, how to develop a habitat management goals and a plan, go over some sample management practices for wildlife and discuss some resources that are available to you to look at managing your woodlands for wildlife. If you remember nothing else that I say tonight, remember that habitat is the key. If you build it, they will come. Habitat is where wildlife lives and it consists of food, water, shelter and cover and living space. And the two most important components of habitat are shelter and food. Although animals can look elsewhere to find food, but shelter and cover will ultimately keep them alive. Another key to remember from tonight is that habitat diversity in your woodlands means wildlife diversity in your woodlands. So let's start with food. Food can range from acorns to the pollen that's in flowers to small mammals and even leaves that moths and other bugs feed on. When you think about the food that's available on your woodland, you want to ultimately or ideally provide several types of foods. Everything from fruits and berries to nuts and acorns, um, nectar like the photo in the slide that we just saw, uh, small browse and forage plants and even aquatic plants. And the reason that you want to do this is having a variety of plants Sorry, my slide didn't advance. Having a, a variety of plants will make sure that there is food uh, available year round. So the more diversity in the plants and the food that you have available, the better it is for wildlife. Diversity in plants also protects against disease, insects and pests. So if you have a stand that is quite diverse and a small amount of ash, Thermal ash borer is prevalent in your county, you aren't likely to experience very drastic effects like you were if you had a stand that was dominant with ash or uh, mixed ash. <clears throat> Another suggestion for plants and food in your woodlands is to select and manage for native plants. They have a greater variety of food with a higher quality and greater seasonal availability. And if you're curious about native and invasive plants and types of plants that you should be considering for your woodlands, you can refer to the publication that I believe Tony sent, it's called, So What Should I Plant? And that'll give you a, a nice in-depth understanding of the different options that are available. Some other reasons to select native plants is that they're adapted to the local environment. So they're adapted very well to the climate, the precipitation that you get, the soil type and the insects that exist. They're also easier to grow than non-natives, although non-natives are quite good at spreading as we learned a couple weeks ago. Um, and native plants will attract more wildlife species, mostly because the wildlife is used to seeing them, so they recognize it as a food source and will continue to come back to it compared to a uh, non-native or an invasive species that they are less familiar with. So some examples of native plants that provide food, and this is looking at a whole year. So we can start in the summer and look for things or plant uh, species like black and pin cherry in the fall look for species or again plant things like ash trees. In the winter we'll look for cedars and hackberry um, and then oaks are an overall great nut tree. Some uh, native shrubs that are good food providers. In early summer you have the service and choke cherries. In midsummer if you want to keep that food source stable you can plant or manage for blackberries 
and then moving through fall and winter, um, looking at species like dogwood and sumac to keep providing those food sources. And there are other ways or other types of food that don't necessarily have to do with the plant matter. Um, insects and other invertebrates will be living and feasted on in areas like what we see in these pictures. So a very old, dead, decrepit down log um, is a great place for these little creatures to hide and be, um, be become a food source. Uh, other things that we'll get into are like what we see in the bottom left, uh, a brush pile and the top right, a potentially dead if not dying tree where a woodpecker is um, looking for a food source. And then a more uh, less natural way is to put out some bird feeders and this can range everything from seed that you buy in a store to the more natural uh, like the oriole feeder in the bottom row that you use citrus fruits for um, and there are some we have some suggestions as to how to use bird feeders to attract more birds to your property one of those is the more feeders that you have the less aggression you'll see if you have a variety of feeders with different types of food, you'll have a greater variety of birds. Um, and clustering the feeders together will help with predation, along with keeping feeders near some cover to give them uh, shelter from predators, but allowing good visibility so that they, the birds that are feeding can see what's happening around them. Another tip is make sure that you can see the feeder and clean them regularly, especially the ones that have the uh, liquid sugar or the fruits stuffed in them. You want to make sure that those are getting cleaned pretty regularly so that they're not clogging up with bugs. So to achieve some habitat results on your property, we've talked about increasing food by planting certain species and by using uh, bird feeders to feed on your property and later we're going to talk about some harvest cuts and why to save mass trees. For now let's jump into water. Water is something that takes many forms and I think what our minds naturally go to when we think about water on our property is something like a creek or a small river, a small pond, but it actually can exist in many different forms and when you think about do I need a water source on my property to attract wildlife? You want to think about the smaller ways in which wildlife can find water. And you want to think about the properties that are adjacent to or around you and whether or not they have water available. Sometimes I think we get excited about uh, having water on our property that may not be completely necessary if one of the neighbors has it and the animals are able to get there and back to get it, excuse me. So wildlife use uses water um, for drinking, bathing and finding food. And typically it's not an issue as far as not having enough um, on landowners properties, except for if you're specifically managing for wetland species in which you definitely would want to consider um, implementing putting in some bodies of water, but we don't get that question a ton. Um, what we do get asked about is smaller ways to provide water sources. And some of those include putting in a bird bath, a saucer, uh, again, a small pond. And that small pond with some plants will really enhance the diversity of wildlife that you see in the area by providing that bigger source of water. Moving water is best and keeping water fresh is a good idea. It allows the water to be used for what it needs to be used for, which is drinking, bathing, and foraging. And something that I want to reiterate or talk about again really quickly is that when you're looking at achieving habitat results in the case of water, don't just think about your own property. Think about nearby. Take inventory. Is there a nearby lake, river, or creek 
that the wildlife you're interested in attracting could easily access and come back to your property afterwards. Uh, building a pond requires a permit often. It's not a reason to deter you from it, but it's just something to consider that it will take more time and energy than some of these smaller measures that can be taken. The third component of habitat is shelter. And just like food and water, shelter can make, uh, excuse me, shelter can take many different forms from the rock pile up on the top right to the nesting boxes in the bottom. Um, the type of critters that you're interested in will have different shelter needs, just like different food and water needs. Some suggestions that we have about cover and shelter is first to increase the amount of structure that you have in your woodland. And what that means is increasing the amount of what, what I like to call the short, medium and tall plants and trees in your woodland. So if you have the short, the shorter ones, the shrubs, the grasses, that will provide cover and shelter for those smaller um, smaller animals that need lower lying habitats. The same with the medium and tall structures. They will provide different habitats that different species need to survive. So the more structure you have, the more potential species you can draw in. And the same goes with uh, what vertical diversity. So having this vertical diversity for nesting sites will give you different bird species. They don't all nest at the same level, if you will. Some of them are higher up in the trees where they can look above. Some of them are very low. So those two things will help as far as increasing your cover and shelter. Another suggestion is if, if possible to plant some evergreens like red cedar, white spruce. And if you can plant these strategically by leaving some space in between them, it will allow them to grow wide and provide some shelter as far as um, predators, but also provide the thermal cover that some of those smaller animals need during the winter. That first slide, I, we, I mentioned um, rock piles or stone walls. So if you live like me with a nice fun creek on your property, sometimes over time the rocks and things begin to move and you have this pile that you don't really know what to do with and it's starting to trickle out into places that you don't want it to. And a great way to use this kind of um, a pile of stuff that you wouldn't normally use for something is to create a rock pile and by doing that you create those small environments for the small animals that need that type of shelter. The same goes for brush piles um, or what we see in that bottom photo which is a blowdown that has some exposed roots and soil that that attracts a very specific smaller species that needs that moist um, microclimate. Another thing to consider is the dead wood that you see in your forest. So I know it's easy to look at it and think that you want to remove it. And that's fair, especially if you live in places that are fire prone or you're looking at a ton of it from uh, potentially a, a windstorm or an ice storm. But leaving some dead wood is really great to attract, as you can see, a number of different types of wildlife from snakes and chipmunks to salamanders and even rough grouse. Uh, but ev even more than that, leaving some of these dead logs allow the nutrients from the log to come back into the soil and really rejuvenate the forest floor. So leaving them can be a really good thing. So the last slide we talked about dead wood on the ground and I'd like to mention um, dead trees or what we call snags. So those standing dead trees that can kind of feel like an eyesore sometimes. Um, but if you stop and watch, you'll notice that there are some animals that use them as their homes. And in fact, we have 70 species of birds, mammals, and amphibians in our state that use snags as a home, which is pretty incredible. Um, 
<clears throat> a very loose suggestion is to have about six snags per acre. And if you don't have snags, but you're interested in creating them, you can use a technique called girdling. And what you do when you girdle a tree is take a chainsaw and make about a one to two inch cut all the way around the tree, depending on the diameter. And you make two of them a couple inches apart. And what that does is it cuts off that X, the, excuse me, it cuts off the layer of the tree where the water and sugars move and keep it alive. So you're essentially killing this tree but you will in turn be providing habitat to maybe a few of these 70 different species of uh, wildlife in Wisconsin. And I'm not sure if, I think we have a forestry minute on girdling or on uh, techniques with chainsaws to do these uh, management techniques. If we do, please post that in the chat, Tony. Another uh, way to provide cover and shelter is by actually creating nest boxes. And nest boxes are great homes for flying squirrels, bats. I've been hearing a lot more on the scientific goodness of bats in your woodlands um, and other species like owls and wood ducks. There are different guides online for different houses. It just depends on what kind of species you're trying to attract. And the same suggestion goes for nesting boxes as for the bird feeders. Just make sure that you clean them out so that they're not getting clogged up and that the animals are able to use them. Another form of cover and shelter is brush piles or snake hibernation mounds. So a good graphic of a snake hibernation mound is up in this top right corner of the screen. So you would dig or use an existing hole and put some of those dead logs and twigs and branches inside and then create what you see on the bottom left, which is almost like a gate over the top out of logs so that you then can continue to stack the logs, twigs and branches up on top to create this nice mound. Um, and then a picture of it, there's a photo of it in the bottom here. And this is, you may not even be interested in providing habitat for some of these um, directly, but you could be interested in, in cleaning up your brush piles and in turn, you could be providing habitat for these different species. So again, achieving habitat results. To provide shelter, we've talked about den trees, brush piles, birdhouses, and why you should consider planting conifers. And I'd like to move on to the one that I think we think about, at least I think about the least, and that's space. So similar to water, space usually isn't a problem, but you have to consider the wildlife species that you're interested in when you think about the amount of space that they need. So there are some species like wood ducks yeah, those are wood ducks uh, that don't need necessarily any acreage. Many pairs of them can live in the same area, but you get into some of the other species that folks like to hunt like rough grouse or turkeys and they need a larger, uh, larger area to have a habitat. So again, something to consider is your neighbor's property. If you're looking at managing for something like turkeys and you don't necessarily have 40 acres with uh, an adequate water system, but your neighbor does, if you really amplify your efforts and work on creating that cover and providing that food source, chances are you're still gonna draw them to your property. A couple other things to consider. Uh, one is the way or, excuse me, the, the types of food that wildlife is attracted to. And the way that we categorize those are what's called a specialist versus a generalist, which I will go over. And then I'll also quickly talk about how forest succession and adaptation play into this. Specialists versus generalists. Um, bears are generalists, which means that 
they can pretty much chow down on anything. They walk around and depending on what season it is and what's available, they'll find something and they'll be happy with it. On the other end are wildlife that are considered specialists. So they really focus or they really prefer a certain thing. They're a picky eater, if you will. A good example of that are woodcocks, which mostly eat earthworms. And this comes back to what food sources do you have available on your property? How many types do you have available? So if you're interested in managing or attracting generalist species, you really want to focus on variety and year round. If you're interested in more specialist species, you're going to have to look at what their diet consists of and look at if it's feasible on your property to be managing for those species. And one that's uh, very interesting is the rough grouse who is a generalist in the summer and fall and then becomes a picky eater in the winter and is uh, you uh, eating mostly aspen buds. So another great example of thinking about what's on your property. Do you have aspen? Could you implement some management techniques to get aspen? If rough grouse is something that you're interested in, does your neighbor have it? All things, uh, all questions to ask yourself when you're considering what you're trying to attract. And then I believe we've talked about this in a previous class, but really quickly, forest succession is essentially how a forest changes over time. So they, forests typically start as the smaller plants, grasses, and shrubs, and over time turn into and increase the amount of softwood and hardwood trees depending on the soil type and depending on how much sunlight is available. But eventually they develop into these full lush forests. And at each stage of succession also comes specific wildlife that live within these, uh, within these succession stages. So this graphic that is on the screen I like to think of it as you can you can look at it two ways. So on the bottom, you can think of which stages of succession do I have on my property? Do I have old growth? Do I have pole timber? And then you can move upward and say, okay, if I have old growth, I can definitely expect to see red fox and maybe some bear and warbler if if there are some less mature but still mature timber stands and the other way you can look at it is if you're really interested in certain species like cottontail you can look at the cottontail range and say okay so if i want to have cottontail for teaching my nephews to hunt i need to make sure that i have some areas of wildflowers and some of those early successional stages that include shrubs and saplings and just starting to move into pole timber. So you know that they like those lower lying habitats. And this is a great graphic that I think is really helpful in figuring out what that question of what is feasible, what is feasible with what you have right now and what can you work towards. So some ways to work towards goals that you have if you're not seeing the wildlife that you have and, you, and you're not in the right successional stages are some timber management practices. And a couple that we will talk about today are clear cutting and selection cutting. Another publication that was in that original email from Tony is to, it's called To Cut or Not To Cut. And I think that's a really nice overview, a more in-depth overview of what we're gonna talk about in the next few slides, which is looking really at what types of cuts will produce what types of outcomes with wildlife considerations and looking at the ways that you can modify your timber stands or your woodlands to adapt to draw these different species in. So on the far left, we'll see a clear cut, which 
most of us are familiar with. It's taking out a large number of trees. Um, and this mimics large natural events like windstorms or wildfires. And so what comes back after a clear cut are these sun loving species, excuse me, like aspen, tamarack, jack and red pine. Um, and again, I'm gonna jump back to the rough grouse cause it's an, it's an easy bird to pick on. If you're interested in managing, let's say for rough grouse and you're okay with clear cutting, you're interested in it and you're working with a forester and they say, yeah, if we clear cut here, aspen can come back. That would be a great way to enhance the potential that the grouse are gonna come back and be feeding on your property when they're picky eaters in the winter and they wanna go other places, they may in fact stay on your property instead. Um, let's jump actually over to the right, the selection cut. So this is on the opposite end. It's mimicking, it's taking one or small groups of trees and mimicking smaller natural events like a, a tree falling in the woods and it makes a sound because it also hits a couple other trees on the way down. Few trees get taken out. And what comes in after a selection cut is, is shade or are shade loving species like ash and some maples and balsam fir. And so you'll want to look at these different types of cuts and consult with natural resources professionals, foresters to figure out what types of cuts can get you the, the wildlife that you're interested in and how these two things can work together. Some things to consider when you're thinking about clear cuts and wildlife. Go for irregular shapes, have more edginess and more natural looking. Um, having those really flat lines and hard edges can deter wildlife from moving through the area. And if you're interested in, in having them move through there, just make it as natural looking as possible. You wanna leave uncut areas around water to protect the water quality and also to make sure that the water stays at the temperature and is able to regulate the way that it needs to, to be a good body of water for the wildlife. And leave some dead trees and shrubs, don't cut them all. Leave some that can stand for woodpeckers and songbirds to create nests or dens in. A little more specific, but consider if you're looking at doing clear cuts, consider and, and consult on if you can break up the area into smaller units that were that are cut over time instead of clearing an entire area one time. And this will help you maximize the benefit of a clear cut for wildlife. Again, I'm going to go back to the rough grouse. This will maximize it by providing young stands, which are great for grouse brood cover, keeping some mature stands, which are perfect for food and shelter, and then leaving the old stands, which are which are ideal for their breeding grounds and having those um, dead down logs where they can drum and um, have visibility for predators. I believe I touched on this a little earlier um, that some of those things that we look at that we want to do something about and we want to clear them out and we want to clean it up but we really got to consider to leave it there so coarse woody debris branches treetops things that sometimes get left behind after a logging job or after a couple trees come down think about keeping it scattering it and creating food and cover for smaller animals like rodents and insects and by doing that, you in turn create great hunting sites for birds and um, animals like bears to find and hunt for these animals in the wood piles. So we earlier talked about the selection harvest, which is pulling one, I'm sorry, cutting one or cutting a few trees and creating these almost like these little bear patches. And this is great if you're interested, if you're a birder and you're interested in enhancing some of these uh, really neat bird species like goshawks. Um, goshawks need these dense blocks of woods that we see where we've kept them intact 
for nesting, but they also use these open patches where the selection cuts happen to hunt and to be able to see what's happening on the ground. Some other selection or some, some other suggestions when thinking about selection cuts is if you can retain a variety of nut producing trees. So things like oak, hickory, walnut. Um, and a, another suggestion is if possible, keep around 35 nut trees that are 14 inches or more in diameter per acre if you have these species on your property and are considering a selection cut. And this will really make sure that you have those that diversity in food sources even if you are managing and cutting from your property. Some other suggestions don't cut all the old trees with sprawling branches they're great den trees and also good nut producers protect some of those seed and berry producing shrubs again keeping that diversity high and continuing to provide food sources through the summer and fall. Um, and then leave space between trees. The space between the trees encourages shrub growth, which again, we keep talking, I keep talking about diversity, but it encourages a greater diversity of species to be on your property and also the animals that hunt those species. Some other considerations I'm going to talk about really quickly are dead and dying wood, perch and nest trees, and then wetlands and seasonal ponds. So dead wood, standing dead wood, we talked about the snags and making sure that you've got a couple of those per acre. You always want to check those for wildlife dens. Sometimes they want, you want to take them down. There's no wildlife dens in them. You've got more than enough snags per acre and that's fine, but definitely avoid cutting inhabited trees if possible. And again, try to keep that one to six dead trees per acre for these um, nice wildlife dens. Protect perch and nest trees. So things like large pines, especially near water bodies, provide eagle and osprey nest trees, places to nest. Um, and then large oaks, maples, and other long-lived trees are great perch and nest trees. I already said that, but especially important near waterways so that these birds, um, larger birds can hunt. Protecting wetlands and seasonal ponds. Uh, Wetlands and seasonal ponds provide great habitat for things like frogs and salamanders to uh, to build homes and also for some species like songbirds to forage. You'll want to maintain dense stands around your ponds, especially on the south side for shade, but maintaining them around the ponds will make sure that you have that good water quality and tree cover to make sure that the water is able to keep the temperature that it needs to. So what should you manage for? There's a few ways of looking at answering this and you could think about it from the perspective of I really have certain species, featured species, I love hunting turkeys, I love hunting pheasants, I really want to manage for those species for that priority. You could look at it as groups of animals. So if you are becoming a birder or you're a birder and you want to enhance the ability to do that on your property without having to go to a park, you could look at how to work with what you have to enhance that group of, of wildlife. And then another way to look at it is just increasing the richness or the diversity of your species overall. So what we see on that right image, not just thinking about cranes, but also thinking about badgers and thinking about voles and, and looking more at the big picture. Whichever way you decide to go, there are six steps to designing a wildlife management plan. And I'm going to go through all of these in a little more depth. But first, you want to do your homework. And I'm not going to assign it in this class, but if you're interested in creating a, one of these plans and really starting to explore what your woodlands can do for your wildlife goals, learn about the species you want to manage for. There are a lot of great 
books, Peterson Field Guides. Um, we've produced some of these books that are shown here that will outline what habitat requirements are needed for these, what types of food, how much water, the type of cover and the type of space to help you figure out, is it feasible or what you need to do to make it feasible. So step one is identifying your objectives. And in that email from Tony, he should have sent a publication called Putting Pen to Paper. And this is just a great way to sit down and think about, all right, what are my overall goals? What are my short-term goals? What projects do I have planned? And how can those projects fit and help me meet my short and long-term goals? And this is just a, an exercise you can do on your own with your family before you really get started, just helping you put pen to paper, but also put your thoughts on the paper to keep yourself organized. Step two is create a map of your property. This could be something as simple as drawing. If you're good at drawing, I'm definitely not. Um, put, uh, put down where your landmarks are. Where do you have bodies of water? Do you know your property boundaries? And then try to walk through your woods and write down what successional stages you see in what parts. Another way would be to look at something a little more sophisticated. So getting a, a map of your property, contacting a local forester or another natural resource professional that could help you get a map of your property and start to identify some of these things. Um, and take notes of what trees and what plant species you see. Where do you have um, large snags or berry patches that you want to preserve, brush piles that you could use. And then also be sure to take notes if you can north, what's north of you, what's on your neighbor's property and this to the south, the, do they have a creek? Keep, keep those things in mind and make sure that they're noted somewhere so that you can really look at that bigger picture. And this is better than what I would produce, but this is something, this is something you could easily create. It's got road boundaries. It shows where the different types of stands are, where the dead snags are, where the ag field is. Something like this is a great way to get started visualizing what you're working with after you've written down your goals. Step three inventory the wildlife on your property. So the reason you want to do this is you want to know what you're working with um, to be able to figure out if you are doing the right things and enhancing the wildlife that you're trying to over time or not. And if you need to adjust, uh, adjust what you're doing. Great way to get started on this is another publication that should have been in that email and it's called how to inventory and monitor wildlife on your land. Again, this is going to take a much deeper dive into how to do this and hopefully answer some of the questions that you may have about specific techniques. But here's a here are a few of them. For birds, you can do uh, participate in brooding surveys, do some nest box surveys if you're able to build and implement those. Um, for mammals, you could do track stations like what we see in this picture here. Clear a spot, dump some sand, put an object in the middle that will attract animals, and look at the tracks. Clear the sand, repeat, and do that a few times to get an idea of what's moving through that area. Something that I like to use a lot is camera stations. I love looking at trail cams. I like the data that it gives you, time of day. You get to see what's moving at what time and move them around and see if there's different species moving through different parts. Um, and then you can also do things like fro frog and toad surveys. I don't know why I have such a hard time saying that, um, or pitfall traps. Step four. Seek professional advice. So this is a, it's a, can feel like a big task, but talking with folks that are professionals and have done this and have a ton of experience in this, like DNR wildlife folks, DNR foresters, NRCS, conservation groups, um, extension wildlife specialists, 
uh, even private consultants that charge a fee for their services. All of these folks can help you really narrow down what you want to do and how to do it and make it an enjoyable, exciting experience to, to manage or to enhance the management that you're doing for wildlife. And some suggestions are consult various disciplines or agencies. Um, get a couple opinions, get one, two, three opinions before you make decisions. Get advice on some of the outcomes that can happen if you do different management techniques. So come up with a few um, management actions that you're comfortable with and ask what could happen with these and just get a, a better sense of the bigger picture of what can happen. Determine if your objectives are realistic. Uh, this is something that those professionals can definitely help you with, especially if they are doing a property walk with you. The next bullet point, the professional ideally should be surveying the land with you. And in this property walk, you can point things out, you can show them around, and they can help you figure out if what you're trying to do is, is realistic. And finally, settle on your management objectives and sketch out a habitat management plan. And a habitat management plan can be something very simple, like here is what I want to do. Expand red cedar pine wind breaks around the house into a five row shelter belt for wildlife. Okay, how am I going to do that? Write down your wildlife goals. Write down the time frame that you're working in and break that time frame down by season. So take a goal set a time frame and put it into manageable chunks where you can get exist or collect that baseline data, see what's out there, implement some of these management actions, and then take notes of what has changed and if it has helped enhance the wildlife on your property. And the last step is monitor and evaluate your results. So look back at that baseline data. Look back at what you've done, the projects that you've implemented, the management activities that you've done, and really think about and write down how that has impacted the types and numbers of wildlife on your land. Review and modify your objectives if your priorities or your land conditions change. If you go through and you do some say you do some different type of cuts and it really provides great shelter for the smaller mammals, but you're realizing that you should be focusing your efforts on doing some small clear cuts. Take note of that, write it down, and continue working with the professionals to get you to reach your goals. So some resources I'd like to wrap up with. Talked about a few of these. Peterson Field Guides are great kind of broader overviews. Um, this bottom row are some of the publications, the books that we have available, I believe, on our website. Um, our website has a ton of publications specific to wildlife. A few of them were included in that email from Tony, but I really urge you, if you have questions on specific types that we didn't cover, you have you know, more specific questions about things you can do, check these out. There's a whole section on wildlife, uh, woodlandinfo.org, and go uh, click on publications. Something that we didn't talk about tonight, but that we have publications on <laughs> as well as when wildlife is a nuisance or when it's damaging things on your property and how to deal with that. We have some of those available to you. Um, again, woodlandinfo.org slash publications. So the homework that I will assign you are your next steps. If you're interested in enhancing the wildlife on your property, managing for different species, um, get out this winter when we're still probably stuck at home, throw the snowshoes on, inventory your land, see what kind of habitats you have and see what wildlife are out there develop and implement your plan, work with the professionals to do that, and keep a journal of your observations and changes so that you can modify your strategies in the future.
we had three great foresters with us for this series and any of them I'm sure would be happy to talk to you about managing for wildlife, happy to discuss doing a walkthrough. Um, so I believe their contact information was sent to you in an email, but wanted to just remind you of that resource. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Bill. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, again, I wanna remind folks to use the chat feature to uh, send your questions to us. There's already been a couple of good ones. And Tony's been busy posting a ton of links in there of uh, information related to things that Lauren has talked about. So go into the chat, scroll up and down to see it all. <clears throat> One uh, question about bat houses, how high they post them. Tony put a lot of good information in there. Um, so I encourage you to look at the chat. It's <laughs> more than we should be able to talk about here. Also, um, I wanted to pose a question to our DNR colleagues about wildlife uh, resources that are available uh, at, from the nurseries. I know that there's uh, wildlife shrubs you can get from uh, the nurseries and I wonder what they're, how to get a hold of them or how to order them. And I was wondering if Ben, if, if you wanna chime in and talk a little bit about that. Sure can, Bill. Um, yeah, the state nurseries do sell uh, assortment of wildlife shrubs, uh, ranging from dogwood, hazelnut, juneberry, uh, nine bark, uh, plums, and uh, those have to be ordered. I believe it's a minimum order of 300 uh, trees or shrubs per order. Um, but if you're grouping them in, you can maybe order with a neighbor or a friend. You know, to if you don't need that much, that's very possible. Um, and uh, shipping, uh, contacting the nursery ahead of time. And that is on the DNR website, uh, phone number and website. And usually I believe it's a paper copy you order from. I haven't ordered trees from the state nursery in a while, so I'm kind of ill prepared, but I believe there might be a um, order form too online. And uh, order this time of year if they're still available and typically trees and shrubs come in the springtime usually end of april somewhere in there i got a, a question ben for that's that maybe you can help answer someone asked a question about um mfl program and they're interested in diversity of wildlife and habitat rather than timber sales and wondering if still the mfl program is something that would be good for them i get it, it all depends what what they have, but it, for the MFL is a managed forest law, you know, forest program. So if, you know, the timber is ready, matured, whatever it may be for a harvest, I do believe in the program, the plan would explain what to do in that 25 or 50 year period that you would enroll in. So, you know, potentially if you're not sure if the MFL program is right, maybe contacting a DNR forester in your county before you enter the program and kind of getting an idea of what would be expected of you and if you did enter in the program. Okay, thanks. Again, send in your questions. We're happy to answer them. Uh, Pony, Tony, not Pony, Tony <laughs> has posted a link to the, uh, the, the order of shrubs and trees from the DNR nurseries in the chat. It includes uh, species availability and prices. There was, uh, Ben, do you get a lot of, I suppose a lot of the questions you get are about, uh, uh, you know, managing for certain species. Is it, is it pretty easy? I mean, what, what's all involved when, when you get a question like that and trying to help people get exactly what they want from their land? Yeah, I would think probably the number one wildlife species people like to see more often is deer because a lot of people own their land for deer hunting and creating, developing, and maintaining habitat is typically goes hand in hand with forest management doing a harvest, you know, allowing sunlight <clears throat> through the, the canopy to the forest floor to, you know, stimulate new growth uh, and cover, things like that. Aspen, Aspen regeneration or clear cut, as Lauren mentioned, is probably one of the easiest and best habitats we have and we can provide. So not only if you do a clear cut to regenerate and stimulate the aspen sprouts, but you also get a little bit of money you know, in your pocket at the same time. 
and uh, providing great wildlife for deer, but also for neotropical songbirds, woodcock that migrate through and, and grouse. It's one of the best habitats for those three or four different uh, wildlife species I mentioned. Okay. Uh, Lauren, you mentioned the uh, camera stations. Do you know of any like general guidelines for how to, what's the best way to put a camera up or where to place it so you get the best pictures? Uh, this might not be guidance, but what I've learned is to walk in front of it and make sure that it can see you, <laughs> which are tend to be the, the most entertaining pictures on my trail cam. Um, honestly, I think at least you want it to be in an area that's clear, uh, especially if you have a really fancy camera that takes a lot of photos rapidly, smaller um, grasses and branches that move will collect photos. So if you can get an, a clear area that you have an idea of the that something is moving through there, I would do that. I'm trying to think of how high. I know it's at least as tall as me, but not taller than me. And this this guy that you see right here, he has been on the trail camera many times. My cat, he he frequently is captured on there. <laughs> And Cindy uh, posted that Snapshot Wisconsin is a great program that loans out trail cameras. Is that what you participate in or is that your own trail camera? It's my own, but I actually really like to look at the Snapshot Wisconsin photos because I think it's sometimes I I forget how many things we can see. Uh, you know, I see what's on my property and it's not a ton, but you get to see some really cool things through those photos that you wouldn't normally see. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Cindy. That's a great program. There's, I think there's a video, uh, uh, someone has a video camera set up of uh, a log across the stream. I don't know if you've seen this, that's just capturing wildlife going across this log. And it's an amazing array of wildlife that use that little bit of, to get across the stream. And uh, if you can find it on YouTube, I encourage you to, to watch it. I wish I could remember what it's called, but it's a lot of, I always, I, I watch it again and again because it's such great wildlife to go across it. I think um, one of, I remember one guideline I remember is uh, like a 45 degree angle to a trail where a tra the point of camera rather than directly at a trail at a 45 degree angle, you, you tend to get better pictures. I hope that's right. <laughs> I hope I'm not giving bad advice. <laughs> and we have a Facebook live session. That's right. Tony uh, did a, uh, a session of Snapshot Wisconsin. So um, go to our YouTube channel, which post Tony posted a link to in the chat. You can uh, see the recording that he did on Facebook Live. I don't see any other questions. Um, thanks a lot. I guess we're done then. Thanks, uh, great presentation, Lauren. Thanks for everybody for attending. On Thursday, we'll be talking about timber harvest. So uh, we'll see you then and everybody have a good evening. Thanks everyone.